In this video, I'm gonna be sharing with you business secrets from the richest man who ever lived. Yes, from the life of King Solomon. I'm breaking all of it open. Recently, we had an in-person event called Digital Product Millionaires where people paid tens of thousands of dollars to be in this room. But I'm gonna take one of my sessions and share it with you in the video today. Make sure to like and subscribe, hit the bell, leave a comment down below, and let me know if you wanna see more content like this. Let's get started. I wanna share with you guys and gals today some of these uh, success principles that my wife and I have been able to, to step into and specifically from the life of Solomon, okay? And uh, before I get too deep into it, for those who don't know, uh, my name is Rick, and uh, for the past 20 plus years, uh, I have been actually a missionary, a worship leader, 79 nations, been all over this globe, um, you know, have been able to, to serve in that capacity, and it's been awesome. And one of the biggest things that I begin to see is not just uh, in church circles, but in world, in, in you know, uh, uh, secular circles, it's like everywhere I went, like most people seem to be broke. Anybody see that? Just wave at me if you guys know what I'm talking about, Right. And it's like, what? why is everybody broke? And I didn't realize that the reason why it seemed like everybody was broke is because I was actually broke and I was just hanging out with the wrong people. Why is everybody broke? Everybody's struggling, man. They've had the price of gas. Oh my gosh. And oh, the price of eggs. Well, guess what? It's because you, you've got to level up your circle, man, right? You've got to level up your circle. Why are events like this so incredibly powerful, so incredibly important? Because... Of a little story I want to share with you. There was once a little baby acorn, okay? And this little acorn, everyone say, ah, right? There's a little baby acorn, and this little acorn was sitting up on this windowsill, and it was so cool because right across from the windowsill, there was this beautiful forest of gigantic evergreen oaks. Is that a thing? Ever, where, is that a thing? <laughs> what are the biggest trees? Oak trees? Thank you. Thank you. Guys, let's give it up. Let's give it up for you guys. So, see, that's why we have tree people in the program. Okay? So every day this little acorn, listen, every day this little acorn would look out the window and see these gigantic oaks and see this beautiful forest. And every day this, this little acorn would look outside and go, oh my gosh, that is so awesome. And the little acorn began to say, man, I, I bet I could be an oak. Like, I, I wish I could be an oak. I want to be an oak. And day after day after day after day of this little acorn sitting there, he began to get discouraged because he began to feel like, I want to be an oak tree. I know I can be an oak tree. I desire to be an oak tree, but I just don't know how. And so every day, every day, the, the discouragement would get deeper and deeper and deeper. And then guess what happens? One day, this little acorn, sweet little acorn, is up there on the windowsill in his new routine, looking out the window, wishing, desiring, man, I wish I could be that. I want to be that. I feel like I could be that. I just don't know how. And he's sitting up there and he's weeping. <laughs> and all of a sudden, this little sparrow hears the little acorn crying and this little sparrow flies up to the window and he pops in and goes hey what's going on and the acorn goes I just I just I want to be an oak tree so bad I just want to be an oak tree so bad and I know I can do it I just don't know how to do it and I just I just wish I could be an oak tree and the sparrow looks at me and goes why are you being so silly right now and he goes what he said you're being so silly he goes you absolutely have an oak tree on the inside of you. Yes. But your problem is, is that you're just simply in the wrong environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the rest of the story goes, this little sparrow picks up the acorn and goes, plants the acorn in the correct environment. Somebody say correct environment. Correct environment. Plants the acorn in the correct environment. And you guys know how the rest of the story goes. Time. Seasons pass, and this little acorn begins to grow into its full destiny as a gigantic, mighty oak. But it doesn't stop there. Because as this acorn began to grow and mature into a mighty oak, guess what else happened? It began to sprout off its own acorns that became their own oak trees. And I want you, come on, just, just tap yourself on this chest, okay? 
I want you to begin to take on that identity saying, listen, I need to change my environment. I need to change my circle. I will tell you this right now, just from personal experience, people are going to judge you. People are going to criticize you. People are going to hate on you. And guess what? I'm blowing kisses to all of them. Oh, you love me? Thank you. Oh, you hate me? Cool. Because the punchline is this. If you live for the praises, then you'll die by the criticisms. And the second punchline is this. No one's opinion, good or bad, pays any of your bills. So what I need you to do is you need to begin to realize in your heart that you deserve and should desire to figure this business and this money thing out. Because guess what? Your family deserves more from you. Your children deserve more from you. Your children's children deserve more from you. Does anybody here agree? And the only way that that's going to happen is you've got to begin, instead of just looking out the window and being like, I I know I could do it. I wish I could do it. I just don't know how. You've got to to continue getting in environments like this where people are not having broke conversations. If you're taking notes, write this down. Refuse to have conversations broke conversations. The second somebody starts complaining about the price of eggs, I say, bye, Felicia. I don't got time for the low level thinking and the low level words. Why? Because your words create worlds. Your words create worlds. And if you're sitting there too busy putting all this energy into complaining, why it's so hard, why I can't do it, it's so expensive, we're never going to do it. Oh my gosh, you paid that much. If you're putting that much energy into that, guess what you're going to get? Outputs release inputs. Or sorry, inputs release outputs. So if you're inputting all of this negative talk, guess what's going to happen? You're going to begin to reap what you have sown. And especially if all the people that you hang out with, if they're talking like that, guess what? If you're hanging out with five broke people, you're going to be the sixth one. Right? But you got to level up, man. It's time to become the oak tree that God has called you to be. And not just for you, but for those who are coming after you. See, you got to get a bigger vision. If you're taking notes, write this down. I need a bigger vision. Most people only have a vision that's big enough for their own life. But you need to get a vision that is for you, for your kids, for your children's children. Let me submit something to you, and then I'm going to jump into some of Solomon's wisdom here. But absolutely insane. Book of Genesis, God comes to Abram, and he says, yo, Abram, I know you're an old man. I know stuff don't work the way it used to, but I want to bless you with a son. Did y'all catch that one? I know some stuff don't work the way it used to. Anyways. (laughs) They're old, man. They're like in their 90s at this point, right? And God's saying, listen, I'm going to hook you guys up. I'm going to give you a son. And out of you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And so Abram, just like you and I, guess what he tries to do? He tries to fulfill that word in his own faith, in his own understanding, and says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go hook up with your girl over here, not my wife. And here you go, God. Here's our son. He's Ishmael. Thank you, God. You're going to bless him. And God said, listen. That's not what I said. I said, I'm going to give you and your wife a son. And, and Abram, here's the punchline. Abram was trying to get into enough faith for a son. And he could barely even do it. But God said, oh, here's what I got to do, Abram. Come with me outside. Come on, son. He says, come outside. He says, look up at the stars. He said, can you number them? He said, no. He said, exactly. He said, you are trying to get into faith for a son, but I have faith for whole nations. So I want to submit to you that as you begin to embark in your business journey, in this this financial journey, what you've got to begin to understand is that what you are stepping into cannot just take your faith, it takes God's faith. by that. Abram could all, he could barely see past his own life to try to get into enough faith for a son. And God's saying, dude, your vision is too small. You got to start looking to the generations coming after you. 
You got to start dreaming for your children and for your children's children. Proverbs 13, 22 says a righteous man or woman leaves an inheritance for their children's children. And don't tell me that it's just talking about a spiritual inheritance. Yes, it is. But the next part of that verse says, and the wealth of the wicked will be stored up for the righteous. It's talking about money. If you're the one who always needs a miracle, how can you be a blessing for somebody else? If you're the one who's always like, God, we need a breakthrough, how are you going to be a blessing to somebody else? Guys, we need to change our mindset. We need to get a bigger vision. I love how Sis said, man, I came here. I'm believing. I'm pressing in. We're building our business to 300K this year. I want to challenge you. Instead of having 300K, just in your context, just because you shared this, instead of having your number be, man, we want to make this this year, what if that became your giving number? In fact, I want you to take 10 seconds and I want you to think right now of the biggest number that you desire to make in your business, let's say in the next three years, okay? Be realistic, don't be like $10 trillion, like, okay, take $10 trillion action then. But be realistic, stretch yourself a little bit, okay? And I want you to think for 10 seconds and I want you to write down that number, okay? On this, on this page right here, on your notes. Okay, what is that number for you? Is it a million? Is it a million a year? In three years from now, would you have liked to have generated 5 million, 10 million? What is that, right? When you got it, say, I got it. I got it. Say, I got it. Hey, I really hope that you're enjoying the video. I want to invite you guys. I have recently created a free training teaching people how to make money online. My students are literally making anywhere from five to $10,000 a month. And some of them even make hundreds of thousands of dollars, not in a year, but in a single day. If you want more information on how you can get started, all you need is a phone and a laptop. You can go to digitalproductacademy.org or you can click the link below in the description. Guys, after you watch the free training, if it sounds like it might be something cool for you to check out, you can book a free call with one of my client success coaches and they'll be able to help you more. Now, back to the video. Then right below that number, I want you to, to write this. This is my new giving goal. Why? Because guys, that number you just wrote on the page, that's your faith. That's not God's faith. You got to get into expectation, man. Part of being an entrepreneur is you've got to lift your vision higher. I was talking with some, uh, some of you yesterday, and it's so cool. The team and I, we were doing quarterly planning the past couple of days, and I think it was Christy. I just want to shout out. How, how many of y'all are thankful for Christy, wherever she's at? Shout out, Christy. And Chrissy, for those of you guys and gals who don't know, Chrissy was a teacher for a long time. I just found out this morning, she's fluent in Spanish, by the way. And I'm like, what? Like the guy came in, she's like, hold on. So I'm like, bruh, are you serious? But she was like, we're doing quarterly planning. She goes, huh, I wonder what entrepreneur means. And we looked it up. What was it, two days ago, Pete? Yesterday, two days ago? You know what entrepreneur means? Entree, which is like, you know, the, the thing that goes ahead. Preneur is risk taker. Chrissy, I just shouted you out. So there she is. Give her a hand. Give her a hand. Give her a hand. Entrepreneur. What does it mean to be an entrepreneur? It means to be one who's willing to take risks before others. Somebody's got to get a bigger vision, man. Somebody's got to dream more than their life. Because listen, if you can accomplish your vision in your lifetime, it's too small. You got to start thinking about the generation's coming after you, man. And that's what I so, so love about King Solomon, this wisdom of King Solomon. And I want to submit something to you today before we even go into the event. One of the first things that I want to just seed into your mind today is very, very critical. It's out of the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And starting at verse 13, I'm going to read you guys a passage that I hope blows your mind as much as it has been blowing my mind as I've been rereading it together. Ecclesiastes 9, starting at verse 13, this is Solomon talking, okay? And Solomon's just dropping wisdom bombs left and right all up in here. And then Solomon says like this. He said, I also saw under the sun this example of wisdom that greatly impressed me. Could you imagine being Solomon, wisest person that ever lived, and said, actually, this piece of wisdom actually blew my mind. Get ready, because that's what it's about to do, okay? I saw under the sun an example of wisdom that greatly impressed me. And then verse 14 says, There was once a small city 
with only a few people in it. And a powerful king came against it, surrounded it, and built a huge hedge to besiege the city. Now there lived in the city a man who was wise, but he was poor. And he saved the whole city by his wisdom. But nobody remembered the man. So I said to myself, write this down. Wisdom is better than strength. But the poor man's wisdom is despised. Listen, I know that there is so much ick and ugh around words like rich and prosperity and abundance because most people have used this language, have used it in a selfish way to build their own life, their own fame, their own kingdom. But I want to submit to you that you have got to get rich. Why? Because it doesn't matter how, how much you grow in wisdom. You could save whole entire cities. You could save whole entire families. You could build gigantic corporations. But it, none of that matters if you are wise and poor. Because the wisdom of a poor man or poor woman is despised. What does that mean? It means there is something to be said that wealth is the reward of wisdom. If you're taking notes, write this down. Wealth is, the, this is, this is actually one of my hybrid Proverbs. By the way, low-key, I'm writing my own little book of Proverbs. So let's see how that comes out. Can I give you one of them? And this is obviously inspired, you know, by, by the Bible and by Psalm. But write this down. This is one of my new Proverbs. Wealth is the reward of wisdom. But a fool and his money will soon be separated. It sounds like the Bible, right? Guys, money don't hang around fools. Why do you got to get into a different environment? Why do you got to level up your circle? Because all those fools who are saying, man, it's so expensive. Or what about these fools? All the haters going, you're going to do what? Some of you guys and gals are, are coming out of ministry or missions world like me going, what? You worship mammon now, don't you? I know it. You're all about the money now, right? But the punchline is this. It don't matter how wise you are if you're poor. Guys, it is God's desire for his people to become exceedingly, abundantly, above all you could ask, all you could think, all you could imagine blessed. Because if you're the one who continually needs a breakthrough or a miracle, how are you going to help anyone else? The vision's too small, man. The vision's too small. When you're in scarcity, you're just thinking about yourself. How can I get to the next day? I need you to begin to level up your expectation and your mindset to begin to think abundantly. Like, man, I got to figure this money thing out. I got to figure this business thing out. Because first of all, God desires for us to be a blessing in the earth. Like, if you were the, de let me ask you a question. If you were the devil, whose finances would you attack? If you were the devil, who would you want to be broke? Your people or God's people? If you were the devil, would you try to confuse your people about money? Or would you confuse God's people about money? Guys, we've got to get our, our mindsets and our expectations right about God's desire for his children to be blessed. If you're a parent in here, throw your hands up and just wave at me like this. Do you desire for your kid to be poor, struggling, hungry, dressed in rags, like malnourished? You're more holy if you are. If lack and scarcity are so good and make us so holy, then why does the Bible tell us to give to the poor? Wouldn't that take away from their holiness if we gave to them? Come on, guys. We got to lift our vision higher, man. We got to see beyond a sun and we got to get a vision. We got to get a vision for nations, y'all. Yeah. Nations. 
And it's not just, it can't just happen in your lifetime alone. It's got to happen. You got to get a vision for like, okay, I'm going to set up this part of the plan. And then my kids are going to take over this part of the plan. And then their kids are going to take over this part of the plan. It is so insane because later on in the New Testament, whenever this story is being told about Abram, okay, it literally says that this big thinking was accounted to him as righteousness, If you're taking notes, write this down. The righteousness of thinking big. And then I want you to put a question mark around that. And then I want you to go from this place and begin to wrestle over what does that mean to you? Abram Abram had to see dozens of generations in the future to understand wow, the potential of my life isn't just for a son whenever I'm old. God wants to do something crazy in my life. And I'm here to tell you this morning, God wants to do something absolutely mind-blowing in your business. He wants to do absolutely mind-blowing stuff to where you literally begin to step into this reality that not only am I wise, but I am wealthy. And none of this has to do with my glory. It has everything to do with God's glory. Because... The wisdom of a poor man is despised. So now that we're laying some foundation of how we got to get our mindset right, we got to change our circles, we got to change our conversations, okay? And by the way, I'm not saying you got to be like, you know, mean to these people whenever they're having these conversations. But what I simply do is I either don't participate or I just leave. Because that's not the frequency that I'm on. How many of y'all know that energy is real, right? The sun's giving energy. I'm not a new age person whatsoever, right? But energy is absolutely real. And if you're taking notes, write this down. High energy leads to high income. Think about it. If you're one of these people like this, oh, man, I don't know. Everything's so expensive and it's so hard. Oh, man. If you're doing that, guess how much income you're going to have. Do you ever hear wealthy people talking like that? I don't think so. Why? Because high energy attracts high income and low energy attracts low income. Guys, you got to lift your vision higher, man. A cheerful heart is a continual feast. Like we've got to get our hearts and our mindsets right about what God says about our, uh, us being blessed. Okay. I think one of the biggest reasons I'm, I, and I'm working my way here to, to Solomon's principles, but one of the biggest reasons why so many people are broke, and then, of course, in this context, why so many of God's people are broke is because too many people have conflicting internal beliefs around the subject of money. What does that mean? Many people have the false mindset that building a business is bad. Well, sister, you should be building the kingdom. You should start a church, not start a business. Can I submit something to you? Business is better than charity. What does that mean? No one can give anything if you don't have. I know it's super noble to think like, oh, you're giving back. First of all, I'm not giving back anything because I didn't steal anything. I earned this one. I put the labor into this one. I became the person it took. I did the work that it took. And I have what I have now because of that that principle, right? But the punchline is this. Why are people broke? Because number one, they think that charity is better than business and it's not. But number two, they have conflicting internal beliefs around the subject of money. Out of one side of their mouth, they're saying, if you have money, you're greedy, you're bad, you're wicked. You're starting a business, that's wrong. But out of the other side of their mouth, they're literally saying the opposite. Man, we would love for you to sow a seed and we want to send the missionaries. We want to rescue orphans. We want to, but which one do you want to do? Is money good or is money bad? Which one? It's good. In the book of Genesis, God called seven things good. He said, man, creation's good. These animals that I made, they're pretty cool. Right? He's calling all these things good. And the eighth thing that God called good 
was in the book of Genesis. It says this, and there was gold in that land and the gold was good. Can I ask you a question? Here, look at me, look at me. Can I ask you a question? How many people were in the garden in the beginning? It's not a trick question. Two, thank you very much. Give yourselves a hand, give yourselves a hand, give yourselves a hand. Were these people selling or buying anything from one another? No or no? Which one? Was there anything to purchase in the garden? No or no? Then why would God put gold in the land and call it good? Because God has purposed for wealth, abundance, prosperity, to be the portion for his people, even if they don't have need of it. Money's not bad. Money's not neutral. Money is good. The love of money is bad. But all these prosperity police that are out there saying like, oh, beware of the love of money. They also need to be aware of, uh, you know, you've been, you've been broke your whole entire life. You're grown and you're broke. So you're, you're, the scam that you think that I'm trying to run over here, I have nothing to scam you from because you're grown and you're broke. You've already been scammed. Wow. Guys, we got we to gotta lift our vision higher, man. We got to try to count the stars. Somebody say count the stars. count the stars. So if you go up to somebody and say, hey, does, do you believe that God wants you to be wise? Most people are going to say, absolutely, Yes. But if you ask them a follow-up question, say, do you believe God wants you to be rich? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, like, according, I mean, Solomon was rich, but maybe like a book of blah, blah, blah. It's like, which one? If you're taking notes, write this down. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 18. I'm going to jump in here, and then I'm going to get to Solomon's business principles here. Okay. Why do most people end up struggling their whole entire life? Never building wealth when a small percentage end up building such insane amounts of wealth that it lasts for generations. I submit to you that one of the greatest problems that most people have when it comes to wealth is they don't even know what wealth is. Wealth is not money. Write that down right now. Wealth is not money. How do I know this? Because here in America, we have a place called the Federal Reserve Bank. What is the Federal Reserve Bank? The Federal Reserve Bank, number one, it's not federal. Number two, it's not a reserve. Number three, it's not a bank. You and I can't go there and do banking. So what do they do? Their whole job is to print out money. But here's the punchline. I remember whenever uh, the pandemic was happening, and they were just like, let's print money. They're printing more money, but guess what they're not printing more of? They're not printing more wealth. And that's when I begin to think, huh. Money, wealth is not money. So what is wealth? And then I'm going to jump to Proverbs, okay? What is wealth? Now, I'm going to give you Robert Kiyosaki's definition because I really like it. It's cool. But then I'm going to give you the Pino definition. Robert Kiyosaki said it like this. Wealth is the ability to live forward without working. I thought that was interesting. I don't think it's complete. And I'm not saying mine is complete either. But let me ask you a question, okay? If you were here on a deserted island, okay? And you had this beautiful palm tree, right? And let's say you also had this gigantic pile of cash. Woohoo! Right? But you were here, and all you wanted was a drink of water, okay? Is this money wealth or not? Money's not wealth, guys. Right? So here's my definition of what wealth is, okay? Wealth is the ability to provide abundant value for someone other than yourself that in return creates abundant options for you. Financial wealth is the ability to provide abundant value for someone other than yourself that in return creates abundant options for you. 
If you're taking notes, write this down. The better you are at creating value for someone other than yourself, the wealthier you will become. So what's up with Proverbs chapter 8, verse 18? Do you believe God wants you to be wise? Yes. Do you, want, do you believe God wants you to be rich? Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe. Uh, uh, it depends. Like, no, no, no. We can't have part of God without having all of God. We can't have part of the principle without getting all of the principle. And how many of y'all know that wisdom hangs out with some really cool buddies? How many of y'all want wisdom? Wave your hand in the air and say, that's me. Well, guess what? With wisdom, check this out. Proverbs 8.18 says it like this. With wisdom comes, number one, riches. Number two, honor. Number three, I like this one, enduring wealth. And number four, prosperity. So for those people who are like, yeah, I believe God wants me to be, to be wise. But guess what? If you believe God wants you to be wise, guess who hangs out with wisdom? Riches, honor, enduring wealth, and prosperity. Are you one of those prosperity preachers? Well, I'm not a lack preacher. You, you believe the prosperity gospel? I don't believe the lack gospel. So what do these four things mean? Riches, number one, this is actual, your finances. When you grow in wisdom, you'll grow your finances. What is honor? Wisdom brings favor in relationships. Okay? Honor is simply having good standing favor with God and with man. Okay? What's enduring wealth? Enduring wealth... You guess it. This is generational inheritance. Okay, and what's prosperity? Book of John told us, beloved, I pray that you be in good health and prosper even as your soul prosper. Guess what prosperity actually is? It is actually health and well-being. Do you believe God wants you to be wise? Yes. Do you believe God wants you to be rich? Well, I don't know. Uh, guess what wisdom brings with her? Wisdom is going to increase your finances. Wisdom is going to increase your favor in your relationships. Wisdom is going to allow you the ability to know how to wisely build generational inheritance. And wisdom is also going to allow you to prosper, which means that you will be in health and you will be in well-being. But the problem is, this language has been so tainted. L listen, if you ever see a part of the kingdom that has a lot of turmoil around it, and a lot of confusion around it, and there's one camp that's taken it all the way over here, and another camp that took it all the way over there, we should really pay attention, because in my conviction, that is the enemy sowing seeds of discord to try to bring confusion and, and division around something that is incredibly important. Yep. 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 And one of those main places is the place of finances. It's a place of being rich. And guys, I'm telling you right now, you are not going to get rich, number one, by praying your way only, or by only praying your way there. So just get that out of your mind. I know you're probably hanging out with people like, oh, we need a financial breakthrough. We're just going to pray it in. The, we're going to pray it in. No, you're not. You got to work it in. You don't need a financial breakthrough. You need a mindset breakthrough, right? Like we need to understand if you want your life to be blessed, why does wisdom bring such a blessing to your life? Because wisdom has so many cool friends, man. Right? And as you grow in wisdom, you will grow in these things. Don't just be a poor wise man or a poor wise woman. You got to become a rich wise man or a rich wise woman. Got it? If you got to say, I got it. I got it. Now we're going to jump in. I'm really excited about this. And I'm going to wrap with this here, guys. Just 10 more minutes. I'm going to fly through. Okay? You guys are listening too slow this morning, man. Okay? Y'all are listening too slow. 
Write this down on your paper. Solomon's business model. How many of you know? How many of y'all know that Solomon was the wisest, richest man that ever lived, besides Jesus, of course. And I am going to break down one. How many? I'm going to break down one of his business models. By the way, there are dozens of his business models in the Bible. This one play I'm about to give you from the life of Solomon can and will make you millions and millions and millions of dollars if you simply just take action on this one play. Anybody excited about that? Just wave at me. Say, that's me. That's me. First Kings chapter 10. I'm just going to read through this here. First Kings chapter 10 says this. When the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon and his relationship with the Lord. I'm just putting a little highlight on that. You believe however you want to believe, but the reason why I'm so blessed is because I'm connected to the best. Just saying. Queen of Sheba, she came to test Solomon with hard questions. How many of y'all know that when you begin to step out into this entrepreneurial business thing, people are going to come and begin to test you with hard questions. Stop complaining about it and start rejoicing over it. She came to test him with hard questions. Arriving at Jerusalem with a very great caravan. Basically, she's bawling out. Verse 4, when the queen of Sheba saw the wisdom of Solomon and the place that he had built, watch this, the food on his table, the seating in his, uh, with his officials, the garments that his attendants we're wearing even down to the cupbearer. She was so overwhelmed that the spirit was taken from her. Guess what happened? She's looking around. This is how you know you stepped into wisdom and riches the way that God desires for you. When people don't just see you, when they see how excellent your people are, yeah. they fall out. Yeah. Whoa, this is insane. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you right now, it was, it was warm my heart for a couple of you guys and gals to walk in and go, wow. Because, man, we're trying to do something excellent here, man. Yeah. We're not like, we're not trying to do this like scarcity. No, no, I'm not trying to throw shade. But like what I came from, a missionary mindset, oh, just hopefully we can get a crumb or two. No, nah, man, we want to ball out. Not for the sake of us balling out. We want unbelievers to go, what the heck is happening to those people? Yeah. What are they doing? You heard of my fame according to my relationship with the Lord. That's what happened with Queen of Sheba. Let's keep going. She said to the king, the report I heard about you in my own country and your achievements and your wisdom is true, but it's even greater than I imagined. Let's keep going here. Verse 10. 1 Kings 10, verse 10. Write this verse down. 1 Kings 10, 10. It says this. And she gave the king... 120 talents of gold. Now, hold on. I know y'all just flying by reading this, going, oh, that, that, that's probably nice. After that, it says, and silver, and it lists the silver, and then it lists the spices, and it lists all the treasures. So just the gold. Somebody say just the gold. Just the gold. I'm going to come back to this in a second. 120 talents of gold. Take a guess of how much you guys think this is. If you heard me talk about it before, don't say it. How much you think 120 talents of gold is? I'm going to throw this out there for you. It was roughly $200 million. Wow. And you think you have a high ticket offer? <laughs> You're struggling to charge somebody 500 bucks? Oh, I mean, my course is like, it's 27 bucks. Maybe I have to raise them to 37. Come on, y'all. Now, I'm, I'm not saying charge astronomical prices just for the sake of it. Charge according to the transformation that you can bring. Okay, but here's the punchline, okay? So I'm going to show you here in just a moment. This wasn't just what Queen of Sheba paid him, okay? So what's the first thing you got to do in uh, Solomon's business model? Number one. Oops. Y'all, it is harder to write and talk at the same time. He was a consultant to his contemporaries. Rarees. Okay, I would also call him the king of 
consulting. He was a king of consulting. Listen, if you want to begin to build wealth in your life, you have got to begin to teach people who are behind you and charge them. Somebody say charge them. Why do I not allow people into my programs for free? Because it's my conviction. If you don't pay, you don't pay attention. Do you know how many people I have given access to my programs and my courses and my trainings in the past? I gave it to them for free. They didn't even log in one time. But my diamond clients who pay 100K a pop, they're the most successful. They learn how to make six figures in one day, not in a year, not in a month, in a day, right? Many of them do it in a single day. And they, they literally get a skill that they can use to scale their business exponentially. Like I had a diamond client recently. They had a, uh, a really terrible accident. Had to go to the doctor. Like it was this big surgical thing. It was crazy. And they texted me two weeks after their gigantic, crazy, insane uh, medical accident. And they said, Rick, I am so glad I paid you all that money to get this wisdom while I was in the hospital, I made another $150,000. Principals don't care if you're in the hospital. Principals don't care if you're healthy, if you're sick. Like, guys, I'm telling you, you have got to learn how to charge people according to the transformation that you can bring. You've got to believe in yourself. Somebody say, believe in yourself. Hey, real quick, if you've made it this far into the video and you're liking it, do me a favor, share this video with somebody that you think might also receive some value. My biggest heart in this channel is to simply bring some awareness, financial literacy, and do it all from a biblical perspective. So go ahead and share the video, like and subscribe, do all that stuff too. Back to the video. You've got to begin to consult your contemporaries, guys. Don't be afraid to step up into the wisdom and excellence that God has given you where you're at right now in your journey and charge people to help solve their problems. And by the way, this $200 million, just for reference, go check it out later. How do I know that this was Solomon's, this was his fee? How do I know this? Because in uh, 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 14, it also says in Hiram, he was another king. Hiram also paid Solomon the exact same dowry that the queen of Sheba paid. So guess what? Solomon's like, bro, you can come sit at my table, but you got to pay. Why you got to pay? Because guess what? If you don't pay, you don't pay attention. And number two, the wisdom that I am giving you has the potential to absolutely radically transform your life. It's not a single time event. This is something that you can take and you can begin to multiply in your own life over and over and over and over. So for my diamond clients who I teach how to make 100K in a day, don't you think it's, who's getting ripped off? Me for 100K for the program or them to make 100K in a day? Which one? I'm getting ripped off, right? That's how you should charge your clients. That's how you should consult your clients. You should give them such a crazy, mind-blowing transformation that they feel dumb not paying your fee. Right. Like, man, I need this. I have to pay her. I have to pay him, right? So the first thing you got to do, like Solomon, number one, you got to become a consultant to your contemporaries. Number two, 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 23 and 24. Watch this, and I'm rapping, guys. I'm rapping, I'm rapping. 1 Kings 10, verse 23, 24, King Solomon was great, greater in riches and wisdom. There it is again. He wasn't poor, but rich, or poor, but wise. He was wealthy and wise, okay? King Solomon was greater in riches and, riches and wisdom than all the kings of the earth. Now watch this. This next part is mind-blowing. Verse 24, the whole world sought an audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom that God had put in his heart. What does that mean? All the kings of the earth. Okay, but watch this. Let me ask you a question. Why do I encourage you to do group coaching? Why do I do group coaching and I only do one-on-one -on -one coaching with my diamond clients? Why? Because if I did an hour with you and an hour with you and an hour with you, guess what I'm leveraging? I'm leveraging the, long, the wrong thing. I'm leveraging my time and my effort. You need to leverage your creativity. How many of you guys and gals have ever been over to Europe, maybe to Greece, uh, Rome, and you've seen these beautiful amphitheaters, right? Where you like sit at the bottom of the amphitheater, like thousands of years ago, there's no microphones, right? There's no electricity. And it is my conviction, how did the whole world come to get an audience with Solomon? 
I'm just putting the pieces together. I'm not saying this is actual doctrine or Bible, but I'm, I'm reading between the lines. I believe that Solomon set up events, systems, because he's the wisest man who ever lived. If I can put on a rinky-dink event, surely Solomon's putting on crazy events. Systems, events, conferences, systems, to where instead of him like leveraging his time and wearing himself out to counsel the whole world, guess what he's doing? He's gathering people together and this is step number two that you got to do. Solomon became a communicator to crowds. And I would also say this. He was the king of communication. Guys, if you cannot accurately and articulately communicate what you do to your clients, you are not, you're going to have a very hard time making money. I talked to a number of you guys and gals last night. So what are you up to right now? Well, I kind of doing this. And then there's a little bit of that. And a number of you guys and gals, and that's okay. Cause some of you guys and gals are just starting, but if you're taking notes, write this down. Clarity is the secret sauce. If you're taking notes, write this down. Simple scales, but fancy fails. You don't have to blow their minds. You just have to clearly and articulately know how to solve their problem. That's it. And when you have that, then you need to learn how to communicate to them. How are you going to communicate to them? Well, we show you in the program, in the success path, you can go hack some Facebook groups. Right? You can hustle in the DMs. If you're at this level, you can begin to pay for advertising. But the punchline is this. If they don't know you, they can't flow you. If they don't know that your solution to their problem exists, you are not going to get paid. So guess what you've got to do? You have got to pick up your communication skills. How many of you want to be the next digital product millionaire? Wave your hand say, that's me, that's me, that's me then you've got to become a king or a queen of communicating. Now, the third step, and I promise I'm wrapping with this. Man, y'all listening slow this morning. First Kings chapter 10, verse 25. Sorry, let's start here. First Kings chapter 10, verse 14. Write that one down first. It says this, the weight of gold that Solomon received yearly, and it's talking about a different thing, was 666 talents. But watch this, yearly. Somebody say yearly. yearly. Okay. And then the next part I want you guys to see is 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 25. And it says this, year after year. Somebody say year after year. Year after year, year, after year everyone, say everyone who came and brought their gift or their payment to Solomon, articles of silver, gold, robes, uh, spices, etc., weapons, horses. So here's the punchline, okay? Number one, you have got to consult your contemporaries. Help the people who are behind you and charge them. Number two, you've got to learn how to become a communicator to crowds. Okay, and number three, ooh, this is the punchline, guys. You have got to pick up your continuity cash flow. Guys, Solomon didn't get paid one time from every king and queen of the earth. It says yearly. If you're taking notes, write this down. If you don't have continuity, you don't have a business. What is continuity for those who don't know? Continuity is predictable income. Guess who, let me just hear from you. What are some continuity business models that you can think of off the top of your head? Just let me know right now. Netflix, Netflix what else? Prime. Prime, what else? Amazon, what else? Spotify, what is it? Life insurance. Real estate. Real estate, yeah, I mean, if you have renters, right? But the punchline is this. If you don't have continuity in your business, you don't have a business. So remember at the beginning of today's session, I was saying, you got to think bigger. Right now, you're like, how can I get somebody to pay me $37? That's awesome. But you need to think bigger and say, how can I get someone to pay me $97 for the rest of their entire life? 
This isn't just some cool idea. This is one of Solomon's business models. The whole earth paid him hundreds of millions of dollars and billions of dollars every single year. Your content has got to be so good. You have got to be able to bring such a transformation to your people, to your clients, that they desire to pay you over and over and over and over again until they have finally achieved the result and the transformation that they desire to achieve. So not only was Solomon the king of consulting, not only was he the king of communication, but he was also the king of cash flow. Somebody say cash flow. Cash flow. So guys, here's what I want to charge you with, okay? Here's what I want to leave you with. You got to get your mindset right about wealth, about business. You got to lift your vision higher. You got to believe in your heart. I always tell you guys this. You got to become a millionaire in your mind before you can become a millionaire in your bank account. Stop having broke conversations. Stop talking in lack. Stop talking in scarcity. When a need comes up, don't start thinking, shrinking back, how can we save? Start thinking of how can I create more value to get more income? 